All right, let's try this again. It was in the middle of, the la of trying to do this video. iPad ran out of room, so I had to clear things out, start all over again. So, chapter nine, mass wasting. Um, what is mass wasting? Well, mass wasting is a integral process of landform or landscape uh, formation that involves the movement of material downhill under the influence of gravity. We're not pushing it or pulling it or in any way moving it because water is involved in actually picking up and moving the material or wind or ice. No agent of motion is involved. We're just simply letting gravity work and gravity is pulling material down by itself. So if we look at this, um, what is its role? Well, in terms of the processes at the surface of the earth, mass wasting is generally speaking a step that occurs right after weathering, after sediments are created. Um, if you look at the Grand Canyon, in many areas the Grand Canyon is tens of miles wide and it's about a mile deep. But it wasn't the Colorado River that removed all of that material from every single spot in the canyon. Instead, it was mass wasting that took a lot of that material down to the tributaries and to the river itself and allowed the river to then pick up that material and carry it off. So in um, when you combine it with running water, it basically produces most of the landscapes we see around us. Now, in terms of what we need for mass wasting, we need something called relief. And what we term as relief is the distance in vertically within the landscape. So a high relief landscape is gonna be a landscape where the distance between the highest point and the lowest point is large. So it's something where you've got tens of thousands of feet of vertical distance within the landscape is a very rugged or steep landscape. Very flat landscapes tend to have very little relief. Um, that doesn't mean they can't have mass wasting. You do see mass wasting uh, take place in low relief environments, but most of the mass wasting is going to take place in high relief environments. <clears throat> So, what are some of the controls on mass wasting? Well, gravity is the controlling force. It is the force that controls all when it comes to mass wasting. So, gravity is measured on the Earth as roughly 9.8 um, meters per second per second. So, that means that that's just how fast things are going to accelerate. Now, a force is equal to the mass of an object times its acceleration. Well, the acceleration is gravity in this case, so 9.8. So we just have to have that f mass in order to figure out what the force is. Um, in physics, we use something called a vector diagram. What a vector diagram is, is we can make up a display of what the situation is, and then we use vectors or arrows that demonstrate the directionality and size of the forces involved. And I'll show you one here in just a minute when we get to it. Um, actually, I'll go ahead and show it to you now. So, page 209 in your book, these are vector diagrams. So what they're showing you here is a vector diagram where the large vector, the large arrow here, is the force of gravity. We are on an inclined slope, so we will have what we call a normal force. A normal force is a component of a force or is a force that is acting perpendicular to the plane of the surface. So in this case, it's acting perpendicular to the plane. Now notice everything is coming from the center of the, of the block here. That is because generally what we're doing is we're showing everything is from the center of mass. So we can basically say that really that entire block is represented by its center of mass. Get a little closer again so you can see. So we have this normal force. Now the normal force is going to be a component of the of the force of gravity. And this angle between the normal force and the force of gravity is going to be equal to the angle above the horizontal. So if we were to have 
instead of this flat line being here, if it was to come up here, this angle here and that angle there would be the same. So we can actually figure out what those components are by doing the, the law of sine, laws of cosine also. Um, don't need to worry about that, just giving you that information in case you can make use of it. But what that means is that if we're going to have a force that's a perpendicular component, we're going to have a force that is a horizontal component. And in your book here, they show it as the shear force. Okay, It's the force of gravity that's acting parallel to the surface. You have the force of gravity that's acting perpendicular to the sur surface. If the object is stationary, as shown in the diagram here, this means that we're going to have an equal and opposite force acting against it. Your book calls it the shear resistance force. Uh, you can also think of it as the force of friction. Um, anything like that will work. And then as the diagram changes and they steepen the slope here, you can see that the force of gravity remains the same, but the size of the normal force and the size of the shear force change proportionally. Okay. So what does this really mean in reality? Well, I'm going to take a couple of different objects. Um, I've got my work phone here. It has a case on it. This case is a rubberized case. I have my business card holder. It's metal, so it's nice and smooth. And I'm going to take the textbook. So if I take the textbook, put the textbook down. If I put the phone on it, just set the phone down on there, and I start to rotate the book, at some point, I'm going to get to a point where the steepness of the slope is going to be such that the force of gravity acting along the surface will be able to move the cell phone because it will overcome the friction between the two surfaces. And there we go. So pretty close to a 45 degree slope to get it started and a little steeper to get it really moving. Okay? And it wasn't moving that fast, which means the force of friction was still fairly strong in comparison to the force moving down the slope. What if I do the same thing with the, the card holder? I'm going to start flat on this because it isn't going to take much. About a 10 degree slope, if that, and it starts sliding. Okay. So what what is friction in this case? Well, friction has to do with a couple of different things. but easiest way for us to think about it right now is the smoothness between the two surfaces. The smoother both surfaces are, the less there is for material, to, the less interaction there is going to be between the two surfaces, and the easier it is for things to move. So hands rubbing back and forth, you can feel a little bit of friction in there, but if I have my fingers like this and I try to move through, I get these points of resistance where things are locking together and that's what high frictional forces can do so we can have that happen now what can we do to cause a landscape to happen uh, to have a mass wasting event well there are some triggers again gravity is the controlling force but it's not the only factor we can have water involved and specifically what we're looking at is going to be the saturation of the material with water. What does this do? Well, it does two things. One, it adds weight. Water adds weight. Uh, roughly eight pounds per gallon. So we can add a fair amount of weight for every gallon of water we add to the material. Not only do we do that, but it destroys the cohesion of particles and it can also reduce friction. So water can reduce the friction, allow the material to slide easier. It can destroy the internal cohesion or internal strength of the material and cause the material to fall apart. As we saw with the demonstration with the book and the objects, just steepening the slopes. If we make the slopes steeper, remember when we're dealing with sediments, as we talked about earlier, we have this thing called the angle of repose. The angle of repose is the steepest angle dry materials will hold when naturally piled up um, and remain stable. You can pile things at a steeper slope than that, but they're going to be so unstable that just the slightest thing to touch them or move them is going to cause that slope to come crashing down. Um, and this is just simply because 
over steep and slopes tend to be very unstable. Um, we can also remove the anchoring vegetation. You know, if you look at what's happening in California, what seems to happen in California every time it rains, what do you hear about? Mudslides, landslides. Why? This is usually happens after the fire season. The fires had come through, the vegetation has been removed, and now you have this material that's able to move because the anchoring vegetation is no longer there. And then there's vibrations of the ground, usually. Um, vibrational energy can be just enough to trigger a movement under mass wasting circumstances. Um, you know, the old stories, the old tales about, hey, you don't want to go into the backcountry skiing and yelling when there's a big snowpack because it could cause an avalanche. Well, it's a little harder to do than that, but it can happen. It, it's possible, it's just not very probable, but in the right circumstances you can do it. Uh, in some places what they actually do is they have these big air cannons that fire off these basically supersized blanks to create a boom and that shockwave of sound will trigger landslides. Um, we can also have vibrations cause what we call liquefaction. If there's enough liquid in the material or enough energy in the vibration in a very dry material, it can cause that material, especially a sediment, to behave like it was actually a liquid. So we call that liquefaction. And then we get the landslides without triggers. Um, they can happen. It just, material gets weakened over time. Weathering can take its toll. Uh, in 2003, we saw a very good demonstration of this in New Hampshire. In New Hampshire, uh, there was a feature called the Old Man of the Mountain. Um, your book has a picture of it, page 219. That's what it looked like before two th May 3rd, 2003. You can see it's a very iconic uh, feature. Um, many people thought it looked like a patriot from the Revolutionary War. Okay. Come May 3rd, 2003, it changed. Now, unfortunately, these photos are not at the exact same scale, so there's a little bit of work you have to do to get your eyes to pick out the same points. But basically, you can see that basically the face is gone. It collapsed. The internal materials lost enough strength that gravity was able to finally take it down. There wasn't an earthquake, there wasn't a snowstorm, there wasn't a rainstorm, nothing really affecting it, it just collapsed on its own. And that can happen. We do see that from time to time in many different areas. And a lot of times it takes a little bit of forensics work to try to figure out what caused the landslide to occur. And in some cases, it will simply be the fact that the material just lost all of its internal strength. So. Let's talk about how we classify mass wasting events. Um, we're gonna classify them based on three primary factors. You can see some of that classification right at the beginning of the chapter on page 209, down at the bottom of the page. If I get there, I'm sorry, not 209, 208. Close enough, almost. Bottom of page 208 is this little table, talks about the different types of mass wasting or some of the different types of mass wasting. So generally what we're going to classify mass wasting by is going to be three things. One, what type of materials are involved? And the materials, four basic types that we're going to, we're going to um, consider. The first easiest one to consider, rock. Okay, so you have rock material, you have rocky material that's moving downhill, solid rock uh, or regolith weathered rock. The second is earth, so soil, regolith, whatever, but it's moving down the hill. The third is mud. Now, what's the difference between mud and earth? Water. So mud is saturated soil or saturated earth, while earth is not saturated. So that plays a big role. And then there's debris. Debris is kind of a hodgepodge. It's a mix of materials. It's got mud, it's got earth, it's got rock, it's got vegetation, it's got houses. Um, it's just a, a mishmash of materials that are moving downhill. Then there's the type of motion. Okay, what type of motion are we under? Are we talking about something that's falling? Basically, a free fall is a fall. 
event. So rocks falling through the air, that's a type of mass wasting event. Um, if you've ever driven down Highway 82 or State Route 82 to Patagonia, Senoida, uh, round about mile post 15, you're going through that nice canyon cut along the Senoida Creek, and there's a sign, watch for falling rocks. And yeah, every once in a while, a rock will fall off and come down on to rest on the road. Then there's a slide, sort of like we were doing with the material earlier. Something just basically sliding down the hill. That's a type of motion. And then there's a flow. And a flow is very specific. It's moving like a liquid. So we're talking about materials that are behaving somewhat like water. So they're flowing down the hill. They're not falling, they're not tumbling, they're not sliding. It's just flowing down the hill. And then how fast is the motion? Are we talking rapid motion or are we talking slow motion? If we're talking rapid motion, it's one thing, slow motion, completely different set of circumstances. So that pretty much sets us up for being able to look at and define the different types of mass wasting events. So um, let's talk about it. And your book kind of goes into a little bit different detail than I'm used to. So bear with me as I try to adjust for your book. So, let's start on the slow side of things, okay? Let's go very slowly. So, movements that are caused by slow motion. Well, how does this occur, first and foremost? Generally speaking, uh, the first of these is called creep. And this is where the surface of the soil is basically creeping down the hill. It's a very deceptive downhill movement. It can take years, if not decades, to be able to notice it. Generally speaking, it's one of those things where you move away from an area, you come back years later, you'll be able to notice it. But it's something that if you're living there, you might not notice it at all. Basically, what it is, is a situation where, let's say we have a slope, okay? And we are in the slope in a location where there's moisture in the soil, and we go through freeze-thaw cycles. So there are times during the year where we go below freezing and then back above freezing, below, above, below, above. So what is going to happen in that case? Well, when water freezes, remember water expands. The surface will expand and it will expand perpendicular to its actual surface, okay? But when that ice thaws, that material is going to move down perpendicular to the center of the earth. Perpendicular surface, perpendicular to the center. So the surface one, if we were dealing with a slope, and I'm going to exaggerate this somewhat to try to make it bigger. That wind is really howling out there. I don't know if you guys can hear it. The gusts are over 50 miles an hour. So perpendicular surface would be like this, and perpendicular to the ground would be like this. So this ground would move like this, and then like that. Okay, But we're talking on the scales of millimeters or smaller at a time. Each one of these cycles, not even a, a fraction of a millimeter at every single time. So over time, it's going to cause materials to move down slope. It can do things like with trees, it can cause the tree trunks to bend over time because the trees are, are basically being bent over like this and the wood is gonna constantly try to grow vertically. So it creates these bent trunks or like here, this picture of a graveyard, you can see the tombstones are laid over, or you can see fences, where the fence lines or telephone poles are laid over also. Okay, um, it's not the only type of slow that we can have. There's another one called solar flexion. Uh, solar flexion is a very interesting form of motion. It's um, material that's flowing. Uh, creep is kind of weird because it's kind of half flowing and half falling, uh, half sliding at the same time. Uh, but flows are a little bit different. Uh, again, we're talking about movement. And solar fluxion usually occurs in areas where we have a perma, either a permafrost, i.e. there's at some distance below the surface of the ground, the ground is permanently frozen or we have a very dense or impermeable surface underneath the surface and we get water moving along there. 
Solar fluxion, again, takes place on very long time scales. It creates landscapes. Um, I think your book doesn't really have a good picture of it that I like. Uh, it's really not very good to see. This is a landscape with a closer picture. It'd be like subsequent flows on top of each other, just where you can see the ground just kind of creeping across each other. It creates a very surreal landscape. Um, of just movement uh, flow lobes all over the place. But the, it, it's just a very slow process. It's not something that you're gonna be able to watch happening. It's so slow, it, it takes years to notice it. Okay, now other types of flows, like an earth flow, happen much more rapidly. So the material can actually be sliding down the earth or flowing down the earth. Mud flows are much more common than earth flows. Um, earth flows, generally speaking, the surface tries to stay intact um, and, and will move. Mud flows, everything's a jumble and it's really like a viscous liquid moving through. We can also have debris flows. Um, debris flows are literally imagined wet concrete type of material, but moving like water. And it, it can really be something else to see. Um, there is a picture here in your book of what an earth flow would look like. You have this hummocky surface that's indicative of it and a little bit of a scar up here. Um, mud flows, of course, are completely different. Um, let's see. Yeah. Here's a picture of a mud flow, page 217. Two pictures, there's a dried surface there. You can just see how what it looks like. It was like a river of mud coming down into the community and just devastated the community. Uh, you can also have the same thing with a debris flow. A debris flow can not be as, have more material in it than just mud, but it's gonna go through and it will just destroy things. Um, actually, a great example of the strength and seriousness of this uh, your book has some really nice discussions on some uh, mud flow events, including one person surfing a mud flow event. Don't recommend doing this. But an, one picture I think speaks uh, volumes to the power that we're talking about in one of these mud flow events, and that's on page 219. It's a figure of a portion of Washington State Highway 504 bridge over the, uh, the Tuttle River. That used to be a bridge. That was mud that did that. So that gives you an idea of some of the forces we can be talking about. Um, that was a steel bridge. I mean, it just absolutely destroyed. Another type of, of uh, land, uh, formation we can have, I'm looking to see if your book actually happens to have a copy of it or not, uh, is what we call a slump. And I don't see it in here. So I'll have to go ahead and describe it for you. A slump is a specific type of mass wasting event where the material moves cohesively. It is a, basically considered a slide, uh, almost like an earth slide. But what happens is the material moves rather cohesively. There's this picture on page 214 that they've got. Um, it's not the best. I've seen better images than this of a slump. Um, but basically what happens is the material is breaking and following a curved surface and it's just kind of rotating down. And for the most part, the material is maintaining its internal coherency. And so the surface remains pretty much the same except for the broken planes where movement actually took place. Um, this one is a little more of an, a mixture of an earth flow and a slump, it seems, by the way that it looks. But... The, that's that's that one. Now we can also have the slides, a rock slide, where rocks are sliding down a surface. Um, we can have lands, uh, avalanche or landslide, basically same words for the same types of things. Uh, we can have rock falls. They can either occur by undercutting uh, from waves, wind and water undercutting and then the material drops down or frost wedging can cause rock falls as well on a slope. Um, 
the rock slide. Rock avalanche is a rapid sliding of movement down, down slope. Um, you know, we, we can see these things uh, when they've occurred. Uh, your book actually talks one about the 2014 Oso Washington slides, um, which was very interesting because the mapping in the area indicated that the landscape was prone to this, and for whatever reason, um, it wasn't recognized that where a subdivision had been built was really in in harm's way. Um, you know, it was just a large event and caught everybody off guard. Um, but basically, when we look at these things, the type of material, how it's moving, and how fast it's moving are the are key takeaways in terms of trying to identify them. We can really get into some nuances about trying to identify them, but I think I want to keep it fairly simple at the, the slump, the rock slide, the earth flow, uh, creep, solar fluxion. And in the rock slide, we can throw in, you know, things like a debris flow or mud flow. We can throw in the landslide or avalanche. Um, let's consider them more like subcategories for the time being. Um, now, we can also get landslides that happen underwater, submarine landslides. Uh, again, the same process where you have a, a buildup of material that gets oversteepened, something weakens it, something causes it to start moving. Usually when we're talking about oceans, we're talking about vibrations of some sort, either wave caused or earthquakes. And we get these uh, underwater flows that happen that we call turbidity currents. Um, we do see large sc scars from these on the ocean floor. Um, in terms of the areas where they broke off and then where the materials were deposited. Along the Hawaiian Islands, we actually get uh, underwater landslides that occur. Sometimes they start as above ground or above water uh, landslides and they slam into the ocean. But volcanic islands are prone to collapse and every once in a while a piece of a volcanic island collapses and it will leave a landslide deposit underneath the water. This will also, again, create what we call a turbidity current because some of that material is going to be suspended by the water as it's moving since water is more viscous than air and it will create a very specific um, deposit identity. Uh, think back to when I was talking about sedimentary rocks and how we have graded bedding where we have materials where we have coarse material on the bottom and it gets thinner and thinner and thinner on top. Graded bedding, not only do we see that in flood deposits on land, but we see that in turbidity deposits or underwater landslide deposits in the ocean environments. All right, um, with that, it's a relatively short one for the chapter. I'm gonna leave it off. Again, you guys are responsible for not only the lecture, but the reading for the test. That does conclude chapter 10. Please remember the midterm, which will be uh, in a couple of weeks, will be on chapters one through 10. There will be a number of multiple choice questions, a number of true false questions. Don't leave those blank, please. There'll be some quote unquote fill in the blank or short answer essay. And it's a real short answer essay question, one that you're gonna to have to have two or three sentences to answer. With that, I'm signing off from Boston. I'll get this up as soon as I can. You guys have got your three lectures for the week and I'll see you guys on the fourth.